that's commonly heard in churches across America and probably across the world. When someone will stand up and will welcome people in and say, welcome to church, we're glad you're here. And that phrase many times is something that we overlook and something that we, I think, need a fuller understanding concerning what it means to welcome people to the church, what the church is. And so this year we're just kind of <clears throat> picking at that a little bit and seeing if we can uncover some things about it. And so uh, early on we discussed defining the church, clearing the confusion, what does the word itself mean? A lot of misconceptions are connected to the word itself, uh, much less <clears throat> its meaning. And one of the least commonly ways it is translated, but probably one of the best ways to translate the word church is actually something along the lines of community. Uh, when you see its usage, not only in other places in the New Testament, but in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, a lot of other places, community seems to be the idea behind the word. And so <clears throat> we spend some time talking about that and the, the importance of creating community. Then we spent some time looking at, over the course of a couple of months, of course, just one study at a time, uh, but we looked at six images that the New Testament gives of the church. Three of them are relational, three of them are not relational, that is a vineyard or a building or something along those lines. And then <clears throat> we spent some time looking at some other aspects last month where seeing, uh, understanding the value of the church by looking at the price that was paid for it. Where we come today is looking at the preeminent one of the church, the one who serves as the center of our existence. When we sing a song like this one, Jesus is all the world to me. If you're like me, many times we can sing songs and not think of what we're saying. When we sing and when we worship, there are so many elements to worship that I think remain unexplored on, on many levels. Um, worship is a statement and a declaration of separation from the world, a separation from worldly ideology, and, a, and an acceptance of and an affirmation of God's ideology. And so when we're saying Jesus is all the world to us, you know, it's easy to say, it's easy to sing. It's another thing to sing it, to understand who Jesus is, and to understand and to reflect upon, does my life really affirm that Jesus is everything to me? And we've got tons of songs that affirm the same thing. This is just one of that came to mind in preparation this week. So... <clears throat> As we think about this, I want us to turn to Colossians 1 that's been read for us, verses 15 to 20. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, um, teaching a text like Colossians 1, 15 through 20 makes me feel about this tall because of the implications. There are certain texts in the New Testament that give us so much information about Jesus that it played such a vital role in the history of the church from the time it was written on through controversies in the early centuries of the church and even down to this very day as we study the person and the work and the nature of Christ, there are certain texts that we draw upon heavily. Things like John chapter 1, John's prologue, 1 through 5, many times mostly 1 to 18. Then you come to the, the great words of Paul in Philippians 2, 5 through 11 or Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 or 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and text like this one. And so as we think about this particular text, I'm going to be the first person to confess to you. And I, this is no exaggeration when I say this. There have literally been hundreds and hundreds of volumes written on a detailed analysis of this text and its implications. I say that to say this, it is impossible for us to really pull back the curtain and see not even everything, but just a few things that are there. Time challenges us and a number of different things. And so as we think about this text, one of the things that it shows us is that Christ is the very, as at the center of everything. It's very similar to Revelation chapters 4 and 5. 
You remember in the Revelation, when John is giving chapters 4 and 5, you we're first introduced to, he's invited up into heaven to see the throne room of God. In the chapter 4, there's an image of the Father on his throne, and that those concentric circles that are coming out from his throne of glorious creatures. But, G, but God sits in the center of that, although he does not have a form. Then we get to chapter 5 and we see the Lamb. And the point that John is making in 4 and 5, or God is making through John, is the Roman imperial ideology was that Rome was the center of the world and the throne that sat in Rome was the center of the whole world. And before the revelation even gets off the ground very well, God says, let me reorient you and let me show you where the center of the universe really is. And that's in the throne room of God. That's very similar to what's going to be done here. Because as Paul opens this letter, he talks to them. It it appears that Paul did not found this congregation. He did not convert the members here. It was started and he heard of it. And so he's talking to them about their conversion. And then he says, God has transferred you from the power of darkness or the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. And then he launches into this wonderful discussion about Jesus. And his nature and the central nature of Jesus. And these, these words in verses 15 through 20 will help us to understand everything else that is said from this point forward in the letter. And really you can't understand the rest of the letter without this part. And so as we think of it, <clears throat> this is basically how it comes to us in this particular setting. So it breaks into verses 15 to 17. It shows us something about Jesus being the Lord of creation. And then in verses 18 to 20, about Jesus being the Lord of the church, the central figure. Now when we look at these texts, many people, and it was pretty common in scholarship for a long time, although it's starting to kind of reverse its trend. Many people believed that Colossians 1, 15 to 20 was actually an, a, a Christian hymn that the Apostle Paul adapted into this writing, along with Philippians 2 and some other texts. And they have their reasons for that. There are about seven of them. Don't worry, we're not going to go into them. I want to keep you awake for a little bit longer than that. But there are about seven of them. In my personal judgment, I don't see the rock-solid evidence that says that these were hymns. However... One thing that is undeniable is when you study their structure, they do show some signs of being written in a poetic style that could have been hymns, okay? Now, the second thing behind this is there are about six different ideas of what Paul is trying to confront, okay? Is Paul trying to confront Roman imperialism, which would have been pretty pretty prevalent in the area of Colossae? Is he trying to refute certain Hellenistic philosophies, Stoics, those of Plato, those who um, held different ideas about the Logos or the Word of John chapter 1? What he most likely, in my opinion, is talking about is he's playing on and giving us an exegesis of Genesis chapter 1 along with some of the wisdom literature, perhaps Proverbs 8, and even some of those books written during the intertestament period that are not inspired, but yet they hold certain historical value and tell us about the belief systems of Jews in what we call Second Temple Judaism. And so he's going to build on that, something they already understand, and he's going to show us the implications of who Jesus is. So, One more thing, and then we'll actually get into the text. Welcome. This is what it's like being in a Bible class at a university. You get in, you think, we're going to get into the text. You're not going to get there for a month. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, You're going to spend a lot of time talking about all the other things, and then you'll get into the text. There's one other thing, and that is the structure of this text. So when you study a text, and this is something that we have to remember... As much as we may not like grammar when we're in school, we will never escape it. Especially to be a student of Scripture, you cannot escape grammar. Because grammar is showing you what the writer is actually saying. Okay? So, trying to unpack the grammar of what's going on here. There are two different schools of thought. And one of them 
Both of them have, are plausible. I happen to think one is more plausible, and that's the one we're going to follow. And that is, one sees the first phrase of verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, as connected to what we would consider to be the first stanza or strophe of this poem. Okay? I don't. I see 18 as a complete shift, and I think there's an overemphasis on some things in grammar there. But just beware, there are some people that could see it a little bit differently. It doesn't really change anything, okay? But it is important for us to take note of. So as we begin looking at the text itself in Colossians chapter 1, you'll notice when you go through, when you heard the reading of the text, you probably saw the English translation, whichever one you use, giving you some marching points about some points of emphasis. For an example, in verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God. Verse 17, he's before all things. Verse 18, he's the head of the body. Verse 18 again, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Okay? Those are our main structural elements in the text. Those are our main structural elements. Okay? So as we look, first of all, at creation, it begins by saying... <clears throat> That he is the image of the firstborn. He's the image of the invisible God and the firstborn. Now, image, and this word is also used in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It's kind of hinted at in Philippians 2 and verse 6. Also in Hebrews 1 and verse 3. It's used later in this particular book in chapter 3 and verse 10. The image of the invisible God. What is he saying about Jesus when it says he's the image of? Well, the idea, and I'm just going to cut through a lot of the information... The basic idea is that he, is the, he partakes in the nature of the God he represents. That is, he is God. okay, And he illuminates God to us. That is, he shows us God. You remember uh, Jesus would say, John 14 and verse 9, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Or John chapter 1 and verse 18, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is currently in the bosom of the Father, he has declared, or more literally, he has interpreted him for us. That is, when we look at Jesus in his incarnation, he shows us God in terms that we can understand. For an example, a statement that we had recently uh, um, was that, how do we feel when, how does God feel when we lose a loved one? Well, the answer is seen in the, at, when, when you look at the face of Jesus, like in John chapter 11. His face was streaked with tears. He's showing us how God feels. He's giving us that which we can understand. And so he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, firstborn is an interesting phrase throughout Scripture. It has a couple of different meanings and attachments to it. It could have reference to something like Exodus 4 and the Jewish understanding. You know, the children of Israel were God's firstborn. Psalm 89, a very important psalm in Jewish history uh, that had messianic implications. Psalm 89 in verse 27. <clears throat> firstborn, you remember in the inheritance rites, Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17, that the firstborn received the preeminence. He was a, a double portion. And so firstborn carries with it privileges and rights and authority. It's not so much the idea some people would affirm that it's, well, in my opinion, it's certainly not that at all, that Jesus is a created being. That goes against everything else we can see clearly in the New Testament. But the fact that he's the firstborn of all creation shows us that he holds authority over creation. Creation is that which belongs to him, okay? And he's going to do, <clears throat> explain that for us a little bit more. Now, in Colossians, you're going to see a lot of times, if you'll pay close attention, that there are phrases like this over and over, like by him and through him and for him and in him. Well, you'll see them here, and that's actually how the text unfolds for us. So, we see first in verse 16, for by him. Now, most translations say by him. Some translations, does anybody have a translation that says in him? You might. That's actually what it should say. The Greek term is literally, it's in. Okay? The translators are giving you their idea of what this phrase means. And the general consensus is that those who are translating it by him are not actually 
accurately giving the notion of the original text. And I would agree with that assessment myself. And so, <clears throat> literally, in him... That he is talking about this sphere of Jesus, which is a common Pauline phrase to use the phrase in him. So in him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. Now this phrase, thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. If you stay within the Colossian letter, one of the things you learn is that he's not talking about literal thrones on the earth and literal rulers. It's very similar to what he talks about a lot in the Ephesian letter, like Ephesians 1.21 or Ephesians 6 and verse 12. He's talking about the angelic order. Ephesians and Colossians have a lot to say about the angelic order and the war between good and evil that exists that we cannot see with our eyes. Now, one of the reasons why he's most likely dealing with this here. So there's this other thing that nobody really knows what to call it. It's the Colossian heresy is what most people call it. Nobody really knows what it is. So when we read the epistles. Okay, so let me see if I can illustrate it like this. <clears throat> so sometimes we might be at home and I might be on the couch reading or something or watching TV. And I hear Brooke on the phone. And so I can hear her having a conversation, and you catch yourself trying to do what? By what she's saying, who is she talking to, and what are they talking about? When we read the epistles, we kind of have one side of the conversation. And it would have been really nice, in my lowly estimation, if Paul had said, hey, here are the cliff notes, and this is what I was really talking about. It would clear up a lot of things for me because we're trying to gain this from looking at one side of the conversation. Whatever this heresy is, it's very peculiar. Um, it has to do, as you will see in chapter 2 and verse 18, asceticism, the worship of angels, going into details about visions, things along those lines. It's very peculiar. It's probably the early roots of what would become a more popular teaching in the second century, which is Gnosticism which is a whole different discussion. The point being, what Paul is driving at here is all of those things that they're placing emphasis on, all of this spiritual realm that no one can see and that these teachers are trying to get people to focus on and set themselves apart because of that, Jesus is the one who created them. You see, part of Gnostic heresy was that Jesus was not actually God. He was an emanation. Okay? Now, we looking at my watch, we don't have the time to talk about that at all. Basically, it means God kept spawning other creations of himself until he found one let, that was not God enough to be able to create and to be involved with the physical world. It had to do with Greek philosophy, things along those lines. So what Paul is saying when he says he created these things... The earth and the heavens, that which is visible, which we can see, and that which is invisible, even the spirit world we cannot see. He's the one. All of those things are created in him. He's positioning the authority of Jesus. And then he goes on to say these things were not only created in him, but they were created through him. He's the divine agent through which they are created. His power is there. And then they're created for him. That is, he's the goal, the purpose. It's for his praise and his glory that he created these things. Then he adds on this in verse 17. He says, and he is before all things. So the notion that somehow Jesus is a created being, no, he, he's in existence before those things. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The same word is used in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5 to describe the word of the Lord that holds the world in place. Why does our world continue in its orbit and its order? Well, certainly, and I'm not denying in any way that there are scientific explanations that God has put in place. But they're doing it because God told them to sit there and to stay there, and they're staying. All things hold together. 
because of Jesus. You see, the point he's driving at, the symbol of authority, of who Jesus is and the convoluted notions that had developed amongst people. But then he turns attention to the church and he says, and he is the head of the body, the church. The head, most likely, when you talk about head and body relationships in Paul's writings, sometimes the emphasis is more on the body and sometimes it's more on the head. In Colossians, it's certainly going to be more on the head, but it, it describes the head as giving life and direction to the body. Uh, in Greek thought, a lot of times it was not uncommon to see the whole world or the cosmos compared to a body. And so Jesus is the head of the body. He gives the church life and direction. That's why later on in chapter 2 and verse 19, he condemns them for not holding fast to the head of the body, which is Christ. Their view of Jesus has become so distorted. So he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning. That is, things find their origin in him. The firstborn from the dead. Again, those firstborns, those inheritance rights. The authority. And even more specifically, people say, but Jesus is not the first person to ever rise from the dead, and that would be an accurate statement. Right? In the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha both raised people from the dead, raised children from the dead. Jesus himself raises three people from the dead that we're told about in the gospel accounts. So how is he the firstborn from the dead? Well, the different one, there are multiple differences, one of which is all of those individuals died again. Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. It's the concept of eternal life that then he can infuse and give to us. So he's the firstborn from the dead or among the dead ones. That in everything he might be preeminent or some translations would say supreme. So what is he saying? So Jesus is God and represented and revealed God to us. All of creation was created in him, through him, and for him. He holds it together. He's the head of the church. He is the beginning. And he's the firstborn from the dead, never to die again. Show me one person that even comes close to having a resume like that. What is he saying? Not only does the whole cosmos, the ordered, created world revolve around him, but even the new creation of the church revolves around Jesus. He's the center of our existence. And so in verse 20 he says, for in him, here are those phrases again, we get our in him, through him, and for him. For in him is the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This goes into chapter 2 and verse 9 and other places we don't have time to dive into right now. And through him to reconcile to himself. Reconciliation means to exchange hostility for friendly relations. And then in the ESV it reads like this, to reconcile all things to himself. But actually when you look at the Greek preposition, it should be for himself. It mirrors the in him and through him and for him of verse number 16. Through him to reconcile for himself all things, whether in heaven, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So much there to unpack. We don't have the time and I'm already almost out of it. So that's the text, the basic thrust being he created the world, the world belongs to him, he holds it together, everything is about him. He created the church, he's the head of the church, he reconciled, he made the church possible, everything is about him. 
Now, what are then the implications of understanding that truth? Number one, <clears throat> there is nothing that is beyond him. Abraham Kuyper rightly said that there is nothing in all of the world that Christ cannot say of it, mine. Mine. It belongs to me. It is for me. Or as Paul would say in Romans 11 and verse 36, for all things are from him and through him and to him. Even my life and yours. Our lives are given to us from God. They are sustained through God. And we have a choice of whether we will live them for him. There is nothing beyond Jesus. Everything in this world is about him. Everything is winding down, winding up, however you want to phrase it. Everything is driving to him. The final day when everybody acknowledges him. Whether they're in the created order or whether they're in the new creation, the church. Either way, it's him. Number two, no man or woman has the right to put themselves in the place of Jesus Christ. People have tried to do it throughout history. The Pharisees tried to do it in Matthew 23. They would shut up the kingdom of God and would not allow people to come in because of their own regulations. Jewish teachers did it, Galatians 4 and verse 17. He says, they exclude you so that you might make much of them. That is, the people who draw, make rules that God did not make, and they throw you out because they want you to think a lot of them because they're the ones who understand the things that you don't understand. They want to be Jesus. Or 3 John 9, where Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence, who alone belongs to Christ. And do you know how this also plays out? It means that my life is supposed to orbit around him. If a person chooses to reject Jesus, they can choose to live their life however they want to. God has made you that way. You have the ability to choose what you want to choose. So when I hear people in the world say, it's my life, I can do with it as I will, while in certain technical points I would not agree with them, in other points I would agree with them. You do have the right. You do have the ability to choose to do what you want to do. But what is unfathomable to my mind is to watch children of God say, it's my life, I will do with it as I will. That is completely against everything the New Testament says. Beginning in a number of places, but like 1 Corinthians 6. You were bought with a price, and you are not your own. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. One of the best sermons I ever heard in my life and still ranks as one of my favorite sermons of all time. <clears throat> the man that was <clears throat> preaching the sermon was discussing how he grew up in the 60s and 70s and the ideologies that warred for his mind and how he interacted with those ideologies and how he came to interact with the message of Christ. And he said, this is one thing I began to understand. That if my life is the result of God creating me, here's one thing I know for certain. I will not dictate what I do with my life. If everything truly revolves around Jesus, I will not dictate my life one bit. If you then be risen with Christ, talking about your baptism, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. 
Set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. There are two ways to understand that phrase, Christ who is our life. He's certainly the source of eternal life, but there's also a way of seeing it to say this. What is your life about? What is my life about? And if the answer to anything to that is anything other than Jesus Christ, then I've got the answer wrong. Christ is my life. Jesus won't allow it any other way. And to be honest with you, when you look at his credentials, when you look at what Paul has said here, how could I ever go and make my life about anything other than him? Why would I make my life about my own pursuits and the things that I want to do and the things that make much of me? Every person that puts themselves in the place of Christ and want people to make much of them for who they are, I can guarantee you, and you can write it down, they're a mess. You know why? Because they're a human being just like you, and you're a mess too. And so am I. And for help with my mess, as much as I love you, you can't help my mess, and I can't help yours. I need somebody who can control the heavens. I need the center of our existence to change me. Then last of all, is that Jesus must be the center of a congregation. Jesus must be it. For far too long, churches... have misunderstood that Jesus is to be central and that the mission of Jesus must be central and that it is Jesus that we talk of more than anything else or anyone else. Sometimes people, when we come and we talk about the church and we talk about branding, people say, the preacher, he should be the face of the church, or the elders, they should be the face of the church. No, the church has one face, and it's attached to our one head, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus should be the one. Jesus is the one who saved us, made us, and he's making all things right again. He's the one we worship, we serve, we adore, we speak of, we study about, we glory in, and in whom we find our supreme joy. When people meet you as a Christian, do they walk away with that idea? When people walk into our church buildings and they partake in Bible class and they partake in worship, do they get the notion that these people are obsessed with Jesus? Their lives revolve around Him. Jesus is who they talk about, Jesus is who they worship. Jesus is who they walk with every single day. Jesus changes the way they relate to people. Jesus makes them joyful in the midst of difficulty. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So when we stand up and we say to someone, welcome to church, we're glad you're here. What we're saying is welcome to a place where our obsession is going to be and we are going to revolve our entire existence around Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we want you to be a part of that with us.
we're in a place that's countercultural and an autonomous society that says, put yourself at the center. You do you. You do what feels good. We're going to be just the opposite. We're going to be a place that says, no, it's not about us. It doesn't matter how we feel. It doesn't matter what we want. Jesus is going to be central. And we're going to love him with everything that we are and serve him with everything that we are for as long as we live. People say, how did the New Testament church grow the way that they did? Jesus was the center of their existence. Maybe somebody this morning needs to put Jesus at the center of their existence. This text falls on the heels of, as we talked about, being transferred from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son that God loves. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. To be buried with him in baptism, Colossians 2, 12 and 13. To be raised to walk and to seek the things which are above in chapter 3, verses 1 and following. And to be renewed as a new man in the image of our creator, chapter 3 and verse 10. Guys, this text is so heavy and it's so central and it's so important that we get this. We have to get this point. But maybe we're somebody that we've taken Jesus out of the center. And listen, there's not a one of us that aren't guilty of that. So we're not going to do the whole pointing fingers at each other. We're going to do the whole Jesus thing where we wrap our arms around each other and say, I've made the same mistake. Let's get focused again. Or maybe we need strength and we pray together with Jesus at the center. If we can help you this morning, that's what we want to do as we stand and sing this song.